curiosity isn't wanting to know or to get, but rather wanting to connect, connect the things we do know to the things we're about to know, but also to connect ourselves to our world and ourselves to each other and communities to each other. And um, so curiosity is this drive to connect and to build some kind of web of, of knowledge. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Perry Zern and Danny Bassett to the show. Dr. Perry Zern is Associate Professor of Philosophy at American University. He is the author or co-author of more than 75 publications in philosophy, political theory, trans studies, and network science, and has given hundreds of talks at local, national, and international venues. His work has been generously funded by organizations like the American Philosophical Association, the Center for Curiosity, and the Lee Summers Fund, and more. Dr. Danny S. Bassett is the J. Peter Skirkinich Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, with appointments in the Departments of Bioengineering, Electrical and Systems Engineering, Physics and Astronomy, Neurology, and Psychiatry. They authored more than 390 peer-reviewed publications, which have garnered over 38,000 citations. Dr. Bassett has received multiple prestigious awards from the American Psychological Association, Sloan Foundation, and MacArthur Foundation, among others. Perry and Danny often collaborate on research about neuroscience, curiosity, and the humanities. Recently, they co-wrote the book, Curious Minds, The Power of Connection. In this episode, I talked to Perry Zern and Danny Bassett about curiosity. For them, curiosity is not just about gaining knowledge, it's about connecting to the world and to each other. Each individual has their own style of connecting. They can be busybodies, hunters, or dancers at any given time. Perry and Danny also weigh in on how social media affects curiosity and how their network model of curiosity can improve education. This was a really fun and great chat. Dr. Danny Bassett and I go way back to my pen days. We used to get coffee together and that was a lot of fun and intellectually stimulating and all three of us had really great energy together and we really nerded out a lot about the science of curiosity and what it means for your own life. So without further ado, I bring you Dr. Perry Zern and Dr. Danny Bassett. Danny and Perry, it is so great to have you on the Psychology Podcast. How the heck are you doing? We're thrilled to be here. Thanks for having us. I hope you're both doing well. And I was very excited to see that you have a new book out. It's called Curious Minds, The Power of Connection. I know you've both been super interested in this topic for a long time. Uh, And I know because, Danny, we we had many conversations at Penn about curiosity and the amazing amazing work you've done. I remember our coffee chats. Do you remember our coffee chats? I do remember our coffee chats. They were great. You know, if you could kind of tell our listeners a little about the background, uh, you know, I, I know it personally, but, you know, if you could just some, give some more context to our listeners about how you got interested in studying this topic and how long have you been studying it, these, these sorts of things, just give a little more context. That'd be great. Sure. I got into curiosity in grad school, uh, primarily because I was uh, researching the history of philosophy, the history of Western thought, and curiosity gets kind of a bad rap in that history. And I just thought, mm, there's got to be more. That's sort of that. That's straight, right? Because today, curiosity is just great. Everyone's sort of on board. And great, you know, let's let's all be more curious. And then in, you know, medieval period, ancient period, folks were like, oh, curiosity gets you in trouble. I got into it in 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 grad school to try to tackle it from a philosophy perspective. And then we started talking about it. See, really, when 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 you were a postdoc, right? Then. Yeah, I mean, at that point, I was really interested in cognitive flexibility and also in brain flexibility. And how is it that the brain can move between different cognitive states? And how can we detect that using an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging machine? Um, And so Perry and I started talking a lot about brain flexibility and how that might then help us to better understand the cognitive movements that are that are needed or that are evinced by curious thought. Okay. So stepping back for a second, so Danny, you're a you're a neuroscientist. Yes. And Perry, you're a philosopher. Am I, am I getting this right? So yes. this right. is a really incredible pairing. Right. <laughs> um, you often don't see such a pairing, right? In trying to really contemplate such deep issues. So first of all, I'd, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in a lot of your conversations that you all have when trying to trying to figure out humans. But also something that people might not know is that you're identical twins. Is this true? <laughs> it's true. You know that I didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> um, you can't no. tell from the faces. 
I, it just never dawned on me. I, you know, like we've hung out. It's not like you explicitly told me, oh, we're identical to, you know, so um, that is, that is so cool. So is this something that growing up, did you two talk about a lot? Were you, were you both really curious kids? We were really encouraged to be very curious um, by our, especially by our mother for, um, sort of, well, through K through 12, we were homeschooled in a very free spirited sort of way. Um, so I think she was always telling us, figure out what you want to know and then figure out how you're going to know it. Um, it was very empowerment centric. Um, so I think, I think we were both naturally curious, but I think our, uh, environment in that respect was really enhanced. I agree that that's something that we certainly had at the beginning of our, um, our lives, but I think that we didn't really start talking about focusing on curiosity as a place to intersect our scholarly work until much, much later. That was really, um, you know, in as we, when we were postdocs. Because I guess, it, you know, what happened growing up is that we tried to sort of separate a little bit and define what it was that we were each interested in. And that's when Perry went off to do a degree in philosophy and I went off to do a degree in physics and then physics and then neuroscience. Um, and, and then it wasn't until after that that we realized actually we still maintain some really key shared interests um, and now we can communicate about them from these very distinct disciplines. And that's where this book came about. I love that. The subtitle of your book is so intriguing. And I, I imagine you wrote it in a, to intrigue people. And it's the power of connection. There's many ways you can kind of interpret that. And, and a lot of people don't necessarily connect the idea of connection to curiosity. Um, so can you talk about in what sense you're referring to connection? Sure, I'll set it up a little bit um, before we turn to sort of network science. But historically, again, primarily in Western intellectual history, which is what I know the most about, curiosity has been thought about as an acquisitional approach, from an acquisitional approach. So curiosity drives us to want to know something. And typically we grab it, grasp it, we talk about getting it, knowing it, taking it home with us in some sense. Um, and this kind of curiosity is, a, is this drive to know, it's this desire to know, this desire to understand, et cetera, et cetera. And while that's, I think, illuminating in many ways, um, this acquisitional approach seems not to be true to our experience of curiosity or of the science behind curiosity. And so we sort of went back to the drawing board and I revisited all the old texts and Danny revisited all the new <laughs> science. And, and we came up with the, what we call our connectional model of curiosity, which is that curiosity isn't wanting to know or to get, but rather wanting to connect, connect the things we do know to the things we're about to know, also to connect ourselves to our world and ourselves to each other and communities to each other. And um, so curiosity is this drive to connect and to build some kind of web of, of knowledge. I have you there with what you just said. Roy Baumeister, um, I've always found it really interesting, his research connecting the idea of meaning making to human connection. He says there would be no meaning making if we're not in the context of human connection, that that's, that that's what meaning is, is the interweaving uh, of lots of different things that you start to connect the dots and when we feel like we have meaning in our lives. I, I wanted, I was wondering how you, um, how you react to that, Perry, that idea and how that connects to the work you've done, the work you're doing at all, you know, and, and how's curiosity connected to meaning, you know, I'm curious if you see any connections there. It's a, it's a really powerful um, quotation and reference there. And it resonates with me a lot. I would say yes. And doesn't that change then what it means to learn or what it means to work in institutions of learning? Um, so many times I think uh, all of us fall into a pattern of thinking we want to pass on knowledge or we want students to gain knowledge, but not so much to make meaning or to build connection. I think, especially through our work, one of the things that we really want to focus on from a, with the connectional model of curiosity is to say, hey, we're here because we want to build things together. We want to craft and create um, meaning and societies, right? Cultures and values together. Not to be these individual mm -hmm. nodes who are simply gathering other individual nodes of knowledge and yeah, stockpiling. Yeah, disembodied ideas <laughs> and things. But yeah, Danny, uh, I'd love to hear some of the thoughts you had there. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the disab- disembodied ideas is a, is a really great phrase. And I think where I was going to pick up maybe is if you think about curiosity as simply acquisitional, where we gather a piece of information and we kind of stick it in our pocket, um, almost like coins that you would then put in a, in a purse of some sort, right? Um, so if that's what happens, then, then what can you then do with those pieces of information? Well, the only thing you can do is kind of take one out at a time and look at it and then put it back and take one out and look at it and put it back, right? Um, or use single pieces of information for something very specific. But what uh, the connectional account offers is a different affordance, which is that once you understand the relationships between ideas, then you're able to reason right? You can say, oh, because this is connected to this in this way, therefore this is likely to be true. Um, And you can reason about things that are conceptual. You can reason about things that are emotional. You can reason about things that are personal and social and and everything else. And so it's, it's that connective nature that actually allows you to think, to make meaning, and then to share the meaning with one another. We don't share meaning with one another as independent units. We speak in these sentences that connect ideas to one another in in broader structures. Um, So the connective model uh, provides these additional affordances, but it also raises some challenges, um, particularly how do we understand the kinds of connective architectures that we make do we each make different connective architectures? So maybe the connective architecture that I am making in one area of work is different than the connective architecture of somebody else. When we're teaching in a classroom, do each of the students build different connective architectures? I think about there's a very common craft that young kids do in elementary school where you have a bunch of um, uh, toothpicks and then lots of the mini marshmallows um, and you build something out of mini marshmallows and toothpicks. And it's this connective structure that sometimes it's very ordered, sometimes it's very tall, sometimes it's very disordered, um, and every child makes something wildly different. I think that's sort of also true in the way that their minds work and the way that our minds work, even as adults. And so the connective model allows us to um, to address that the, the challenge or poses the challenge of understanding those patterns of connectivity. I think addressing that challenge is where network science comes in. So network science is a relatively new and emerging interdisciplinary field of inquiry, which asks the question of how do we understand patterns of connection? Typically, those patterns are in social networks. So the pattern of uh, social connection among friends on Facebook, on Twitter, in real life, maybe even. (laughs) Um, And uh, it allows us to quantitatively characterize uh, those patterns and say how they're similar versus different. And so that's where some of the work um, that I've been doing in in uh, network science comes into play in an important way is is understanding those connectivity patterns. What's the learning curve for network science? How long did it take you to get up to speed on how to use those methodologies? Like could other academics who are from other fields, and let's say they're like super inspired by this podcast, they want to get up to speed on and incorporate in their work, you know? Conceptually, it's, it's not particularly complicated. And I actually want to turn this over to Perry to talk about the connective nature of certain styles of curiosity in in a second. But maybe before we get there, um, I think that there is also a lot under the hood in terms of mathematics that if you wanted to understand, you could, um, but you don't need to in order to understand the concepts that network science is trying to tackle and the typical methods that somebody might use if they wanted um, to bring that perspective to bear on their work. I would just add that there's... um... Network science is really built on the back of um, network theory, which was developed in sociology um, in the 70s. So certainly for ever, everyone who's listening to the psychology podcast and, and who's interested in the psychology, sociology way of approaching things, there's lots you can read um, of network theory if, in a field that's far closer uh, to what you do than neuroscience also. So maybe I can learn a little more because I actually have published papers using network science um, applied to the default mode brain network. Is this the same network science you're talking about? Are we talking about the same field uh, where we've been able to ma- we've been able to show um, how brain efficiency of the different regions of the default mode network, um, the extent to which the different areas communicate with each other actually predicts your openness to experience personality scores. So we, we published that paper. Is that using similar methodologies as what you're talking about? 
It is absolutely. Yes. It's the exact same methodologies. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Great connection. We just made a connection. We just made a connection. We did. Um, I think that the the way in which it's used in terms of curiosity is is both how we understand connectivity patterns in the brain, but also how we understand connectivity patterns between the bits of information that we're acquiring when we're learning something, right? But that work was motivated actually by early work from Perry, where he dug into um, the last two millennia of the Western intellectual tradition to sort of un well, excavate, I guess I would say, particular styles of curiosity that are prevalent in that literature um, and and philosophy as well. So, Perry, maybe you can take it from there. Sure, yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I found well, were three different archetypes of curiosity, ways in which curiosity gets practiced, and specifically ways of building those connections. So, yes, we all build our connections relatively differently, but there are styles, there are recognizable archetypes of how it is that we build our our knowledge and our connections together through curiosity. I'll, I'll just to sort of outline the three. The first is the busybody, somebody who loves to kind of listen to anything and everything and and just just get into whatever topic has, has struck their fancy in that moment. And they have wide interests. Is that the butterfly? Yes, we yeah we use a butterfly as a symbol on the cover of the book. And then there's the hunter, which is someone who's far more focused and really wants to know a lot about a little. Uh, and that person was more likely, not likely to have vast knowledge network, but rather to have dense knowledge network. Lots of information, lots of little tiny connections, all the information that they've gathered about this particular thing. That's a different style, right? What, what, when, if you were to look at the knowledge that's built, it's yeah. a different shape than the busybodies or the butterfly. But then the third archetype is what we call the dancer. And the dancer is someone who typically takes leaps of creative imagination. So you're sort of learning something here. And it's not just that you let the world sort of tell you something new to be curious about, like a busybody. And it's not that you decide, oh, there's a tiny little thing I don't understand here. So I'm going to dig deeper, hunter. But instead, you something strikes you about something quite different from what you've been thinking about. And you say, wow, what if I brought these two together? What would happen? Uh, and so that person is typically really creative, really artistic, kind of has an aesthetic appreciation for what they're building and risks, takes a lot more risk in what it is that they want to know and end up knowing. So their knowledge network we call uh, loopy because there are these big, big gestures uh, throughout it. So those are the three archetypes. And we're not committed to them being the only archetypes forever, right? We have a whole appendix about creatures, animals specifically, and how they might give us a whole new slew of styles, of curiosity. But, but these are three that we've actually been able to uh, experimentally uh, affirm. With Wikipedia users. Exactly. Yes. So you might think, and and we wondered, whether the archetypes of curiosity that have been present, you know, 2000 years ago, would they be the same as the ones that are present now? Has humanity changed? Um, But also, how has technology impacted the way that we engage with information? And is it possible that technology and specifically the internet and online encyclopedias um, are, are, are changing the way that we think, um, and therefore we wouldn't see the same styles of curiosity, right? So there, there are some arguments to suggest that might be the case. So we went into this investigation wondering, would we see the same things? Would we see something different? And this was work that was done in collaboration with David Lydon Staley, who's at the Annenberg School of Communication at Penn. And what he did is that he had uh, participants engage, it, browse Wikipedia, for 15 minutes a day um, for 21 days. And what we were able to do with that data is that we could say, how nearby are people stepping? So if they go from this web page to that web page, how far away are those concepts? So maybe they first start with um, a rhododendron bush, the, the Wikipedia entry on the rhododendron bush, right? And then the next page that they go to is one on oak leaf hydrangeas, which is another related, there's both bushy plants that you might stick in front of your house. So that would be a relatively short um, connection, a relatively short step that individuals are making. Alternatively, you might have somebody who starts with a rhododendron and goes to the Queen of England. And then uh, the third page they go to is on game shows. Um, these are huge steps, right? Uh, and so the that 
distance in the step size is something that tells you about the space that they're walking through. So if you follow each of these steps um, and see, sometimes they go back to earlier pages, um, sometimes they move forward, sometimes they trace, trace back, retrace their steps, then you can see this kind of structure or scaffold that they are building by walking, by clicking through Wikipedia. And those structures then vary significantly along this dimension of being more busybody-like with very distant steps and being more hunter-like so having closer nearby steps. That data suggests that there are, there's a lot of individual variability. We may yeah. each really be different from one another, um, but they span the same sorts of archetypes that we can see from um, the historical philosophical account. That is so interesting. I, and I, so I, my question is, how do we link up um, this framework with some modern day psychology of curiosity research? And I'll just, and I'm gonna uh, put forth two frameworks, and let's let's see how you integrate into your work. I'm so curious. One is some psychologists distinguish between deprivation curiosity and interest based curiosity. Um, they found that these are two different kinds of epistemic curiosity um, that we can be motivated and driven to need to know things, you know, and you kind of like in a deprivation sort of way versus just being interested in whatever kind of comes around. And the interest one is more correlated with positive well-being. Deprivation curiosity has been correlated with lower well-being. And in fact, I found in my research that psychopaths tend to score high in deprivation curiosity. So they're still curious. Psychopaths are still curious, but they're, they're curious in like, I need to know where I'll kill you sort of way. Um, I, I know it's dark. It's dark. But our research research has shown that. Look, you've got New Year's goals, and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious restaurant quality recipes delivered right to your door. If you're looking for an easy way to eat well and save money this year, HelloFresh is a great place to get started. It's cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. With over 35 weekly recipes, they have the options you're looking for to help you achieve your goals. Choose calorie smart and carb smart recipes, or even customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading your proteins, or adding protein to a veggie dish. HelloFresh's latest line of meals is fast and fresh recipes, featuring robust flavors and filling portions that are ready in less than 15 minutes. Personally, I really like HelloFresh. The food tastes, well, fresh. They make cooking easy and fast, and they have options compatible with my gluten-free diet. HelloFresh is really helping with my New Year's goals of losing weight and getting in shape. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Psych21 and use code Psych21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Psych21 with code Psych21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And then uh, the other framework I just want to just bring up for conversation um, is Todd Cashton's five dimensions, joyous exploration and deprivation sensitivity, I think probably map onto the two we talked about. But he also talks about stress tolerance, social curiosity, and thrill seeking as different dimensions of curiosity. Anyway, I just wondering, have you thought about how all these kind of psychological frameworks fit in within your model? Yeah, we have. And in fact, in um, some of our work, we've shown... <laughs> We've shown that the deprivation uh, sensitivity is one that is correlated with the structure of the networks that people are building. So the more hunter-like individuals are those who um, have higher deprivation sensitivity, um, whereas those who have lower deprivation sensitivity are the busybodies or the butterflies, the ones are, that are sort of just flitting around and don't need to fill in any particular gaps in information. You know, they're just expansive, jumping from here to there. Um, so there's actually a really nice mapping uh, from the, the deprivation account, certainly, onto these results. Um, there are There's less strong connections with some of the other dimensions um, that, you're, that you mentioned, but I'm particularly interested in the, the social curiosity part, actually. Um, and I wonder if we, had, if we were to do the study again and ask people to focus, on, to only go to Wikipedia pages that are of people, um, whether we would be able to see a really interesting, again, range of individual differences in the way that they're building these these networks among those pages specifically, and whether that would correlate with the more social dimension of curiosity. I'm so curious about that too. 
I would also add, um, there's, you know, with these, with Cash Did's Five um, Dimensions, one of the spirit of it is something that we share, which is that there are more types of curiosity and formations of curiosity, styles of curiosity than we appreciate. And if we get better at appreciating those different styles or archetypes, then I think we'll notice, we'll be able to notice and encourage and facilitate curiosity in ourselves and in others a lot more effectively. So, so the spirit is something that we absolutely share. I think with respect to the social curiosity, one of the things I've always wondered though, it seems to me that there, some folks have a joyous curiosity in social settings or um, a kind of a thrill seeking um, curiosity in social settings. Or we could go back to my kind of pattern or archetypes. I think there are social busybodies. There are also social hunters. I'm going to get to know you because you're in the area that I need to know about, right? Or or the dancer. I don't know. I just happened upon you and let's collaborate. <laughs> I think I think that social curiosity isn't just um, its own dimension. I think it has all the dimensions in it too. What you said is so interesting. So I agree. But I want to understand more what a thrill, what's, what, what's a thrill seeking form of social curiosity? What do you mean by that? Can you unpack that? I think some people strike up new relationships or conversations mm -hmm. with strangers really easily. And they're just, what will happen? What's going to happen? What's this person going to say? I have no idea. They get asked to a dinner afterward. Great, let's go. I see. Um, and then a more jo so a more joyous. What's joyous uh, form of so just uh, you really get uh, deep satisfaction from learning about a, a person and who they are. Yeah, you just love people. You just love all sorts of people, uh, and you just live that sort of love and joy out toward whoever happens upon you. But it's not. But I think it's. I've known more th more thriller style folks, social folks. Than, 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 than mere joy. I don't know. Or than the simplicity of joy. I also know people who just love people. It's more like the joyous sort. There seems to be a, a deprivation form of curiosity as well. Social curiosity, maybe where you're uh, using people as a, a way of getting your own needs met and you don't really, you're not really curious about them. But you're curious about them to the extent to which Absolutely. your deprivations get satisfied. So interesting to map all this stuff in this in a network science sort of way. How do we map all these different frameworks onto each other? But <laughs> It's interesting. I mean, speaking about social curiosity and social thrillers, I was just listening to a, um, a, a lecture from Talia Wheatley recently um, who said that, you know, why don't we start all conversations with... Um, something like you know uh something very deep that's not about the weather but about what is the a very crazy action that you might be willing to perform something like that um and the idea being that you would get a lot more information a lot more quickly in that way than in uh and you might actually get a lot of social connection that way than you would by talking about the weather um but i also think that it's interesting to ask then where the boundary is and are there boundaries for curiosity right um, what you, Scott, have been sort of raising is that maybe, maybe there are ways of engaging with another person that pass by their sort of overstep their boundaries, or where you you don't maintain enough boundaries, um, or again, when somebody is like using another person for mm. gathering information or for satisfaction, that feels like that feels like an issue of boundaries. So I'm curious about the thresholds on which curiosity might um work and and how to be aware of them as we engage in these practices and that's very relevant for social and political change um, which is much more in perry's domain than mine my earlier book on curiosity which is called curiosity and power really digs in well what are the sort of power structures that um inform ways of practicing curiosity that are more using other people for for what you can gain from them or uh, to put to make it really approachable the early early years of anthropology for example involved uh, a scholar somebody from a from a more typically a more uh, developed area to come in and simply sort of watch and assess and decide what's happening in this culture that's not like mine and then go back and sort of write papers about it and get published and get promoted um and that that style of sort of i can go anywhere and i can take knowledge from any context and go use it for my own conversations and advancement. That's a um, 
a style of curiosity that is what well, really colonial in some sense. Uh, and and so we want to we want to think deeply about well, okay, that's not how one wants to. That's not a kind of curiosity that builds these interpersonal connections and these connections across cultures that I want to support. Oh, I really want to read your book. That sounds so interesting. Um, now, it is possible to be more than one of these types of curiosity um, within a single body, right? <laughs> and we, we switch back and forth throughout the course of our lives and throughout, throughout the course of our days, right? So can you talk a little bit about how... Uh, the butterfly, the hunter, and the dancer in different contexts for different purposes and even at different times of the day um, can interact or can change in prominence? Yeah, I mean, something germane to our own uh, life as, as teachers and as academics um, is simply that we start as as these busy, busy bodies or these butterflies because we have to learn large swath of things. We need to get familiar with a discipline or with a conversation that's already existed so that we can actually start participating. So let's get to know a lot of information. Let's understand this uh, large landscape of knowledge. But then we need to focus it and we need to say, okay, well, what is the question I really want to ask? And what is the area I really, really want to contribute to? Where, where, what do I want to write a paper about or have a conversation about? Um, and then as we focus, the more we focus, if we've had that larger context, there was often a moment in which we can make a, take a creative step or a creative leap. And we can kind of add our own experiences, perspectives, do some experiments, um, craft for, for me, craft kind of literatures or arguments that haven't been crafted before and d make that dancer step at the very end after being the busybody and the hunter and then the dancer who kind of leaps back out and says, wow, what if we could, you know, rethink this entire idea or this field from the beginning? Yeah. And just maybe to echo those same ideas, but particularly from scientific scholarship, which I guess for for your audience, you're probably, you have some of, of both in humanities and in science, but certainly in science, I think I will often go to, you know, different conferences and listen to talks in areas that are wildly different from my own and, or read kind of eclectically. And it's in that more busybody like way that I come up with a new idea. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. That see, feels like it might relate to what I'm doing in this way. Um, and then I go down the hunter path uh, to sort of figure out what actually is there. Is that does the argument have legs? Uh, how would we create an experiment, etc. And then um, fast forward to writing a paper on it, a research article, and then um, writing the discussion section of the research article. You often want to frame like what that work, what those results could mean or could, how they could stitch together so many different other fields, right? What is the impact of that argument on everything else? And you want to connect it out. And so the discussion section of a paper in a scientific scholarly paper is one that does more of this dancer-like style. Um, so within a single scientific project, I think we work, walk through those three. I also, though, wanted to come back to your question of timing, like throughout the day, because I think Perry calls these styles almost as if they're like clothing that you can, you know, take on and off and change yeah. the style of your clothing, yeah. you know, from the morning to the afternoon, and then you're going out later at night, you're going to wear something else. I think for me, I find that early morning hours are ones where I am very, I can be very hunter-like. Um, late evening hours, I really can't. And late evening being like after 8 p.m. So that's not really late evening. <laughs> but, um, whereas I think that I am much more likely to want to have either the busybody or the dancer-like style in the evenings. And that's different for every person. I can imagine that others, Scott, I'm so curious about what you would say is your time of day yeah. type of curiosity. Yeah, I, I'm really thinking this, uh, I was actually just thinking like, did you create a test? like an online test that people can go and like, because I kind of want to take a test and really get a better sense of what my kind of dominant one is. You should do that. Great idea. Maybe that's a collaboration in, <laughs> in, in order here. Yes, because I'm really trying to wrap my head around all three of these mean. Um, I think that probably I am not the dancer after 4 p.m. <laughs> I think that's the most assured thing I can say is that like a after four, like, yeah, I don't feel like I have the dancer spirit as much as I do uh, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. I think the hunter is like in the morning. Yeah, because you said that as well, right? Yeah, I think that's that, yeah, that suits. That's so there must that suits me as well that I resonated with that as well. I wonder, like, 
um, is this, is common. Like you look at the averages, maybe most people, maybe like there, of course there are individual differences, but maybe if you look at the graph of what most people, how they ebb and flow throughout the day, maybe there is like a trend for humanity. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. another research study. I, I'm thinking in terms of research studies here. <laughs> we do in the Wikipedia study, we do show that there's variation um, on the time scale of weeks. Mm. Uh, that somebody may like tend to be a busybody, but you know, two weeks later they may be slightly more hunterish than they were, you know, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So that varies a little bit, but we didn't study sort of within a day yeah. um, what those cycles yeah. might look like. Yeah, well, I also do think our, our listeners would love a scan, like a little quick quiz. What's your curiosity <laughs> type? <laughs> yeah, or style, style? Yeah, and we should bring in some of the other animals from the from the bestiary appendix at the end, actually, yeah, too. That could be super interesting. Thanks. Hey everyone, let me take a moment to talk about an air purifier I'm really excited about. It's called Air Doctor. I'm a real nerd about air quality and I do a lot of research on air purifiers and I gotta say I'm really impressed with this one. According to the EPA, indoor air can be two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. And in some cases it can be a hundred times more polluted. That's a problem since a 2020 report found that nearly half of the population in the US, almost 165 million people, are living in areas with unhealthy levels of ozone or air pollution. Let Air Doctor filter out dangerous contaminants and allergens so your lungs don't have to. Air Doctor uses an ultra HEPA filter that's been independently tested to remove 99.99% .99 of tested bacteria and viruses. Allergens can vary in size, but the average pollen size is about 25 microns, and Air Doctor virtually removes 100% of particles as small as 0.003 microns in size. And Air Doctor 3000 is a purifier powerful enough to circulate the air four times per hour in a 638 plus square foot room. Air Doctor features whisper jet fans that are 30% quieter than the fans found in ordinary air purifiers. It's no wonder Air Doctor has been covered by media outlets including CNN, Money, ABC, and more. I'm really looking forward to trying out this product. Based on the features, I expect to wake up refreshed and without my normal congestion. I've gone through a lot of air purifiers and I expect this one to be one of the best I've ever tried. I am super sensitive to dust and Air Doctor appears to take the dust away from my room while I'm sleeping. Air Doctor comes with a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. So head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code PSYCH and depending on the model, you'll receive up to 40% off. That's right, you're saving up to 40% off. Lock this special in today by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code PSYCH. I wanted to talk a little bit about social media because that's a hot topic right now. Um, are they making us more curious? Are, they, are there ways in which all of this flooding of information without any connection of the dots without any you know it's all this it's a lot of disembodied crap i'm gonna call it not just ideas how does that affect how's that affecting our curiosity you know between iphone google social media all this information overload i'm very curious to hear what perry has to say about this but i do think that um going back to the distinction between the acquisitional account and the connective account i think that um you can acquire information or stuff, um, a, you know, and you can try to stuff it into your brain. But I think that if the focus is on building connection, connection takes time. Mm. And it also takes some amount of quiet mm. um, and room for your brain to actually stitch together and, and notice, oh, this is like that other thing that I heard earlier today. Well, in order to make those connections, in order to sort of build these kinds of inferences and, and these, and certainly relationships with people, it takes time and it takes a little bit of stepping back um, and, and waiting and noticing. And so I do feel like um, social media may be uh, providing us with avenues for acquiring information um, but in order to do a lot of the connection that we need to do, I also think we need to take a step back um, and be unplugged in some senses. Perry, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I would say that social media in general is yet another uh, yet another form of media and this sort of fear that we um, are going to lose ourselves and unable to stay in contact with our souls and with one another has sort of been uh, 
a fear that has arisen around every advance in media from newspapers, the printing press, you know, and, and at advertisements and on. Um, so our worry about what we're facing right now is a technological shift and a, and a, and a, and a exponential shift in media is unique to us, but it also has a historical, a lot of historical precedent. And I think the fears, early on fears were not well-founded. Um, and we are able to negotiate different forms of media in a way that is meaningful and have been able to do that for centuries. So I do think that we can do that today. What is troubling for me following Danny here is not what, um, not the social media itself, but that we don't leave it or that it doesn't leave us that we tend not to sort of put it away, but rather it's because if we have a phone that has all of those things on it, um, it travels with us everywhere. And every minute where there's a down moment where I have to wait for something or someone, um, or use the restroom, whatever it is, um, or my kiddo is fine and I pick up my phone and check something. If it's filling all the, the empty moments in my day, I'm much less able to learn effectively or create, um, powerful things so i think i think it's that i think it's the stuffing quality rather than the media itself. all right so maybe a moral here a moral of the story is uh to be less mindless in your life and to have more times in your life where you have consciously decided you're going to practice curiosity in a in a productive fashion so what does that even mean what i just said is that possible can we consciously practice curiosity does that does that phrase even make sense yeah i think it can i think the more that we are conscious of styles of curiosity ways of practicing curiosity then we can consciously choose to practice them i do think that's true um i also think that we would do well to notice our unconscious practices of curiosity they can teach us a lot of things um i think we're we're, yeah, we're exploring all the time. Um, so kind of sitting back and watching that happen can tell us a lot about curiosity that we may not yet appreciate. I've been thinking a little bit more about practicing curiosity and, and specifically noticing the practices of others um, and noticing which might be unconscious to them too, right? What I find really interesting is to think about people who have been mentors in my life um, and who... Uh, whether they were, you know, actually older than me or not older than me, that they showed different practices of curiosity to me without even realizing it, and certainly without using those words at all. One of the things I find very exciting about life right now is just noticing the different kinds of curiosity that people show, the practices that they show, without ever having, you know, the linguistic articulation um, to say that that's what they're doing. Yeah. How can we apply some of these, these ideas to the education system? And this is an, a, a topic very near and dear to your heart. What would you say to educators listening to this who want to apply some of those principles to uh, have their students practice curiosity? I love that idea, by the way, having, having students practice curiosity. For us, the, the connectional approach is helpful in sort of thinking about these architecture archetypes of curiosity, how it is that we build our knowledge networks. That's helpful because the minute you step into the classroom, if you only think that, or if you typically think that curiosity uh, shows up as someone who raises their hand a lot and asks a lot of questions, um, interacts with the assigned material specifically and a lot, if you think that's what curiosity is, you might miss a lot of curiosity that is happening in your classroom all the time, but just doesn't show up in those recognizable forms. So again, it may not be physically demonstrated with raising hand. It may not be verbally represented by asking questions. It may not be focused on the assigned text itself. It might have already leaked off the page. <laughs> and so if you don't, if you're not sensitive and aware of those different expressions of curiosity, um, not only will you kind of experience a, a downer day because you just think the students aren't interested, right? Um, but the students won't get the encouragement and facilitation that they deserve. So that's, that's, that's the impact, it, that's the front page impact for us of thinking about styles of, of curiosity as, as connecting information in different ways. Amazing. Dan, do you want, do you have anything you want to add there within an education context? I, I remember at one point we had this discussion where you were thinking about like uh, connecting everyone's to EEG machines or, and, and measure yeah. how curious they are in the classroom. Did you ever do that study? <laughs> 
No, I haven't done that study, um, but I have. We have done some studies where we ask people to draw um, network-like maps of the concepts in a class as the class is unfolding. Um, so th throughout the course of a semester, we'll say, you know, here are the 50 concepts that are key to this class. Draw for me the lines of how these are related to one another. Let's do that in week one when you have no idea about the class content at all yet, right? You're, or maybe this is an evaluation of what you came into the class with. And then let's do it two weeks later and two weeks later and two weeks later. And we can see these networks growing and changing and reconfiguring. What we actually find is that the, the connections between um, different subdomains of the network um, become a lot clearer. So early in the class, people seem to be understanding kind of local information and how local information is connected up. And then later in the class, they can really see these longer distance, longer time scale um, relationships. And so that is, I think, um, really uh, interesting and and exciting. But going back to sort of pedagogically what, what yeah. Perry was saying about noticing the different ways in which people are curious and, and displaying their curiosity, um, I really love and encourage it when people in my class will submit um, work that is quite different than what you would envision a traditional submission to look like. So for example, in my class last semester, um, I asked part, all of the students to write essays about the topic weekly, and then the midterm and final were also essays. Um, one person uh, submitted their midterm as uh, modeled after Alice in Wonderland. So it had Alice, it had the Cheshire Cat, it had the Mad Hatter, the Jabberwocky was in there somewhere, it had poetry, it had dialogue, um, and it illustrated the key ideas of this engineering class in terms of Alice in Wonderland. It was wonderful. It was an absolutely fantastic submission. Um, and is not what you would have anticipated or, or asked, but it showed the expansiveness of this um, students appreciation for the ideas and and creativity and linking them in this very different way. Um, so I love making space for students to do something like that. Very cool. Ha, ha, and have you have you gone into schools and worked directly with teachers applying some of this? I've done a little bit of this with K through really six or eight, so middle school especially. And students are very excited about the three different styles and they're they immediately associate, you know, oh, my parents, or this, this one, or this one, or my brother, or my sister. So the, the, the styles are, are really intriguing, and they the students like to think of themselves as, oh, this is the kind of curiosity I have, or I am, um, and it's okay mm -hmm. if it's not the same as yours, or the same as my teacher. So in, the, in that really early stage, it does seem already to be empowering in some sense. Um, and, you know, I'm also interested in what what these mean for a, a classroom in which we have a lot of different learning styles in which we might have a number of different disabilities in which uh, or students who are neuroatypical in a variety of ways which really uh characterizes all of our classrooms well then how does this help open us up as teachers and empower the students to start thinking you know it might not be these three archetypes it might be something different and if a student had this if the, if this kind of sunk into the the culture in some way and a student said you know what professor zern i don't have any of those curiosities but this is the kind that i have and starts describing mm -hmm. it and this is how it works this is what mm -hmm. i need I, you know like great okay great now we let's let's go for it you know yeah. um i just think one of the sections in the in the la very last chapter we i talk about um naoki uh higashida who uh as a, a writer um with autism and and he describes his curiosity as reaching for kind of stars in the sky that he can't always sort of grasp um sometimes you know he could see them but they're not always it's not always that i can get them and pull them down and express them to you um he also talks about them as fish in a in a river um again where you can sort of see them and then sometimes you can't sometimes you can touch them and sometimes you can um so if if curiosity feels like that is experienced like that how do how should i be teaching how should i be entering the room here um and what does it mean for me to validate and um facilitate the way your mind works each of your minds work 
That's I think that's the call now, now that we have more awareness of the real diversity in our classrooms. Yeah, I agree. And uh, that's a very much a, a mutual area of interest of ours is neurodiversity. I really look forward to seeing where this work goes. For the time being, you're, you're doing great work. And um, I really appreciate you coming to my podcast and talking about it. Uh, it's a real honor for me today. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.